25th anniversary of the New York Cosmos first NASL championship. And um, Mara, uh, talking today is uh, David Kilpatrick. He's a professor of English and sport management at Mercy College and the club historian uh, of the New York Cosmos. I just wanna welcome everybody. Thank you very much uh, for making sure that you're all muted. And David, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. It's so great to see so many uh, familiar faces and uh, the, the faces of, of people I grew up uh, admiring, uh, my heroes as a child. Uh, quite frankly, 50 years ago, 1972, pretty tough year for me and my family. Um, but lots of lots of 1972, I'd just as soon forget that I can't. But um, by the time uh, I was a Pelé lunchbox carrying Cosmos fan in 1977, playing my first uh, soccer season on a, on a, on a team, um, I looked back to the 1972 Cosmos uh, with absolute wonder and awe and fascination. Um, already by 1977, um, yeah, I guess I was a really quirky eight, nine year old. I was already obsessed with uh, soccer history and was greedily trying to learn as much as I possibly could about the history of the game. And by 1977, I was a New Yorker displaced to Memphis. So uh, the cosmos meant even more to me in terms of that New York identity. Um, and uh, so those black and white photos uh, of the likes of, uh, well, some of the people that are with us today uh, meant so much to me. Um, I was, uh, I had the good fortune to be at Penn State with uh, Zach Bigalke, uh, who's on here uh, a week ago. And uh, he was talking about, you know, definitions of, of hidden history in some really interesting ways. And, and, uh, and it, it, to me, it, the, the history of the cosmos is very much uh, obviously one of the, the highlights of American soccer history. And Sash is, of course, dedicated to celebrating that, that history. And so much of what we look at could be considered hidden history. Um, but this 1972 Cosmos team, the pre pelé era, uh, to me, these are the real pioneers of the game uh, that literally changed the landscape. Um, so the story of, of what was accomplished 50 years ago today, uh, 50 years ago today, right? It was, it was 50 years ago today on the 26th of August that the New York Cosmos won their first North American Soccer League championship. Um, it was the club's second season in the league and the first season was played at Yankee Stadium in the Bronx. The club had to move to Hofstra Stadium in Hempstead because, well, one game in 1971, 20,000 fans were turned away because the primary tenant said the field wasn't going to be safe to play on. So 20,000 fans were sent away. You can just imagine the public uh, relations nightmare that would be. Uh, so the more friendly confines of Hofstra Stadium in Hempstead really became a fortress for the club in its second year. Um, a mediocre home, uh, excuse me, mediocre record on the road of one win, three losses and three draws, but home, Hofstra became a real fortress. And that advantage uh, carried through the regular season where they were unbeaten at home, um, six wins in, in one draw um, at home, put the Cosmos into first place in the league, which gave a very, very, very fortunate uh, home field advantage throughout the playoffs. Um, they were able to knock out the defending champion Dallas Tornadoes. Um, they played an international friendly right in the middle of that. Um, but then uh, 50 years ago tonight, uh, in the midst of unpleasant weather and quite a downpour, quite a downpour, a crowd of 6,102 fans um, in Cosmos country or what would come to be known as Cosmos country uh, saw this great team uh, win its first championship. So um, it's been a, a bit of a dream of mine uh, for some years. I've had this date in my calendar for years now, looking to this date to celebrate a half century of, of this title win. Um, I have to say, I'm uh, disappointed to pass along the news um, that uh, the architect of this team and the architect, quite frankly, of this occasion today um, I got an email from Clive Toy uh, within the past hour. Um, didn't have a very good night, didn't have a very good morning. So he has to send his regards to everyone. So um, 
the 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 godfather of of the cosmos uh clive toy passes on along his his uh regards um and we wish him a speedy recovery um but uh what i wanted to do more than anything else was to to honor the legacy of this team and again with the cosmos on hiatus right now without a team uh to compete on the field i wanted there to be some kind of an occasion to celebrate the legacy of this 1972 team and give them an occasion uh an event um to have a reunion. Um, and so the rest of us can kind of uh, uh, enjoy that. What I wanted to do is just kind of go around the room um, with the people who had uh, played uh, on the team. And uh, we also have uh, with us uh, John O'Reilly. So we've got from the team, uh, Joseph Yelenek, who scored the championship winning penalty kick, I believe in the South goal, right, Joseph? Yes. Uh, the yeah, penalty yeah. kick that won, won the title. Uh, we also have Randy Horton, who scored the um, the go ahead goal before there was an equalizer on a yeah. header from Roby Young, who's not on here, even though he said he would be. Um, but uh, technological uh, issues being what they will, maybe he'll pop in. Um, so we've got uh, and we've got Werner Roth, um, one of the most famous American soccer players of all time. No, he's not really from the German national team. If you saw Escape to Victory, uh, but. Uh, uh, that's certainly how so many people around the world uh, remember Werner as, as a rock star. And uh, for me, all these guys are great rock stars. So um, without further ado, um, I'd like to just kind of go around the room uh, with the alums. And um, if you could just tell a little bit of uh, your memories from the, the, the championship season, how you came to the Cosmos and, and any memories you have in particular of the uh, championship game and its aftermath. Let's uh, let's start with uh, Randy Horton, since you scored the first goal in that game, and you were the rookie of the year in the in the Cosmos first year, the year prior. Randy, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, hello everybody, and, and certainly it's uh, uh, it's fun to be here, David. I'm, I'm I'm glad to be here, and especially with these guys that that you've drawn together, um, you know, that are on uh, with us, uh, uh, Werner, um, Joseph, uh, and. Ruby couldn't be here, uh, and John O'Reilly. John O'Reilly is here as well. Um, but that was a a, a great uh, 19, 1970. I remember it much because of the fact that obviously I was selected to be the most valuable player uh, uh, during that season. Uh, and uh, probably, uh, the the thing that moved me more than anything else about that was the fact that the people who chose me most valuable player for players who I played against. Uh, my teammates said, no, oh, didn't have a chance to vote for me. <laughs> they may not have voted for me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's great, really uh, great to know that you're respected by uh, the players that you play against. And, and I got to say that, that this team was a great bunch of guys, a uh, lot of fun during the year. Uh, we, we worked hard and certainly uh, we deserved uh, that championship. I'd never forget the championship game because uh, Ruby Young's uh, corner that um, I was able to uh, get to, get my head to, uh, one lead uh, was uh, close to the end when Joseph uh, tucked away that penalty uh, to win it for us. I, I, I'll never forget running around the field, followed by <laughs> spectators holding the tie. Uh, it was good times. And then, of course, uh, up at Meadowbrook and afterwards, who can forget that? We're talking an 86th minute penalty kick. Um, nerves of steel, Joseph. You were already uh, a legend uh, in Europe, um, of course, uh, having played in the World Cup. And uh, it was just kind of some unusual circumstances that took you from uh, Prague to Italy but then to New York in time to join uh, this Cosmos side. Um, young bachelor that you were before then, I believe you met your wife in the, in the Cosmos preseason uh, tour down in Veracruz. Um, can you explain a little bit about how you got from uh, Prague to Italy for a brief while and then here to the Cosmos? Well, my dream always was coming to in the United States, always. And uh, the 1969, I decide 
it's time to uh, make it some kind of move. And I went to Italy, we went to play in Italy. And after the game, uh, I take off and uh, I got caught by uh, the Italian police and I asked for political asylum in, uh, in Italy. And um, uh, I got the fortune, uh, the Italian team in the Hellas Verona, they decide they can one sign me. My only problem was the Italy was uh, uh, banning for uh, uh, non-Italian players, players, right? Yeah. Yes, was uh, I uh, I play like uh, like player when my, I not have uh, so much game plan. After the the Gordon Bradley coming to New York uh, to Verona. Uh, I decided it's time to uh, move, and I moved to the New York Cosmos. And uh, it was the greatest time in my life. Uh, even where they, I don't speak English, my, I speak Italian, and uh, I got a couple of friends where, who was my translators. And uh, uh, the 1972, in uh, the final game, we know how to plan who the <laughs> penalty shot, not no plan at all. And I remember what did it four minutes before the end of the game. Uh, I look in on the bench and Gordon, a Clive Toe screaming, Joe, you take it, you take it. And, uh, you know, in a, in a situation like that, you can be very famous and you can be bad. <laughs> and, uh, I was, I, 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 my mind, I have to, I have to score. And that's why I did. Yeah, after well, you know well, this was a highlight of my life, winning championship with New York Cosmos. Thanks, thanks to uh, Clive Toy, Glenn, thanks to Gordon Bradley, uh, all the players, Randy, Randy Horton, and and George Siega. Uh, we was like foreign legion <laughs> uh, from every part of the world. We were together and. Even with no language or very a lot of guys don't speak English, but we still uh, make it to the final. Yeah, there was a, I, I'm not sure if it was Alex Yanis, I forget which writer for the New York Times, Joseph. There was a, a, a piece in the New York Times that said that uh, you're just learning English. You know how to say hello. You know how to say I love you. But it recommended you needed to learn a new English word, which was star. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you, you were already a star in Europe. But Randy, you were a star here. Um, of course, you were a grad student uh, working on your master's at Rutgers. Um, you'd had a great first season with the Cosmos in 1971. What was it like to have a, a, a world-renowned superstar like Joseph suddenly as a strike partner for you? And it was great. You know, Joseph had, uh, you know, like, like you said, jo Joseph had lots of class and, and some fantastic touches. He just knew, he knew where to, where to be. Uh, and and went to be and when you're playing, uh, particularly if you're you're a striker, uh, then you just love to be playing uh, with players that have the skill of Joseph. And he just, you know, he helped very much uh, to raise uh, raise my game. I I loved uh, playing with uh, Joseph, and 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 the the language was no whatsoever. Uh, we were able to communicate well. Uh, or I don't remember one occasion. Uh, when we didn't understand each other uh, because of uh, because of our language, uh, we both knew the game of football and, and we knew the language of football, and that's how we spoke uh, through playing this lovely game. Absolutely. I I, I know that uh, under uh, Gordon Brad Bradley, who is uh, serving as a player coach that year, um, I know I know Gordon liked to talk about, and Clive used to talk about this. Um, a lot in terms of wanting to entertain the fans to play an attacking style of soccer. Werner, um, of course, with your years uh, later on with the Cosmos, um, have a, you have a great perspective uh, wearing the number four shirt on, on how the, the style of play with the Cosmos evolved. But Randy, uh, Joseph, uh, uh, if you could chime in along on this too, how did the style of play itself, or how would you characterize that from season one to season two um, you know, you had some hard nosed defending there with the, the likes of your captain, Bay, Barry Mayhew, and I want to talk about him in a little bit. And of course, uh, coach Bradley. Um, but it seems to me that the, the mission for the cosmos was really to 
simply score more goals than the opposition. I wonder <laughs> if, but uh, um, I believe you're probably playing pretty much a 4-2-4. Um, and of course, the very first player signed by the Cosmos, George Siega, who emailed me. He may be coming in late. Um, he, he, he had some travel issues. I think his flight was delayed. So he should be joining us a little bit later. George was the very first player ever signed uh, by the Cosmos, but he had an injury early in the season. And the uh, former Israeli national team, uh, World Cup and Olympic uh, team uh, captain, uh, Roby Young, who I'm hoping will join us, who said he'd be able to, um, took on that number 11 role um, uh, on the left wing. How, how did, was there an evolution of the tactics? Or if you can remember any about that, Werner being on that, on that defensive line in your first pure rookie year, um, how defensive minded, how attack minded, what was the team really? And how did the, the system come together through the season? Uh, <clears throat> as Joseph or Randy said, there was never really a game plan in those early days. Uh, you know, we, we were all ethnics. We were all foreign players. I don't think there was an American among us until uh, a couple of years later. So we all knew the game, you know, it's our international language. Um, Gordon really didn't have to say all that much uh, in preparation. We played how we all knew to play the game. 4-2-4, four, four, you know, uh, systems were really undetermined until you got onto the field. I think the big, uh, from, a, from a playing style factor, was that you know most of us were playing in the German American League at the time, uh, playing with the Cosmos part time in the summer. Uh, so our big season was really German American League. Uh, Randy, I think you were playing for the Ukrainians. I was with the German Hungarians. Uh, George and I. Uh, Roby was with Blue Star. So we played against each other and uh, with each other on All Star teams. But in terms of style of play, it wasn't until really the mid 70s where we started to uh, impact the game with strategy, with uh, you know, specific lineups based on uh, the opposition. But in those early days, it was fun. It was uh, gregarious. It was you know, come and play. And that's really what everybody wanted to do. The money was, was irrelevant because it was so little. Uh, the field was horrible, as we all know. Um, you know, postage stamp size, AstroTurf on asphalt. So it wasn't ideal situations. And players, uh, certainly like Yosef, that have been used to playing on nice grass fields, you know, their, their uh, skills, I think, to a great degree were impacted, not overwhelmed, but impacted like all of all of our skills were playing on that particular field. What I remember about uh, those early days, especially 72, uh, was, you know, was, and, and looking back on it now, it was an evolution into the American uh, zeitgeist, in a sense. We were doing clinics, we were, you know, we were spending more time uh, promoting and, um, and championing the game off the field than we were on the field. And um, I think the, the essence of those early days of the cosmos in history is that we introduced this beautiful game to the American suburbs. And kids, even, you know, I've talked to Clive about this, you know, we were, we were the instigators really of girls playing the game because all our clinics, all our camps were co-ed you know, if your feet touch the ground, you could play the game. Um, American uh, uh, parents love the limited contact and the constant action. You know, the, the alternatives were, you know, static baseball or bone crunching American football. You know, uh, basketball was huge, mostly in the inner cities, but it was, I think, parallel uh, to uh, soccer in terms of you know, constant action and, you know, great for, great for kids to play. Uh, the 72 championship game, I remember more specifically for my own mistakes than for, you know, the, the guys that won us the game. I don't remember. I remember I'm sorry, Randy. 
I don't remember them. <laughs> <laughs> Selective memory. Uh, but I got, I don't know if you guys remember, but I got um, red carded about, you know, 10 minutes, maybe eight minutes uh, before the end of the match uh, for, I think I need uh, their, I don't know, I don't remember their striker's name, but their striker uh, fouled uh, Carl uh, right back. Uh, I forget his last name and pretty badly. And, uh, you know, my instincts were, as most of our instincts were then, retaliate now and ask questions later. So I retaliated, got red carded. So the last 10 minutes, you guys played with 10 men. I think it was tied when I got uh, red carded and, you know, just prayed, uh, you know, to the heavens that, um, that Joseph would score that penalty. Uh, and then of course the big, the big celebration after, you know, chasing Randy with the trophy and uh, it was just ecstasy run amok. Uh, there were there was no security, so fans were able to come on the field. They stripped us literally naked, if you guys can remember, uh, to Gordon's horror because he had to now buy. He saw in his eyes the dollar signs, you know, and uh, people were just you know taking the shirts off our backs and um, and we just let them. So it was it was huge. It was the beginnings of something that I don't think any of us really understood at that time. I think maybe Clive had that vision, uh, you know, etched in his mind about that future dream team. But at that time, we were a family. We were a garage band. You know, we were rocking and rolling. We were playing. We were getting paid a little money. We were traveling well. You know, we were getting out of Dodge every every once in a while, and uh, it was great. It was brilliant. Uh, I think it established, uh, from my personal perspective it established the enthusiasm that I would continue to carry through uh, the rest of my career. Yeah, that, that, that brings up a really Im important uh, challenge that uh, somehow uh, John O'Reilly had to meet, right? Um, John, <laughs> you'd gone from working in, uh, in hockey uh, to, to joining the Cosmos and uh, taking on this challenge as uh, Director of Public Relations. Um, did that just seem like uh, harder than climbing Everest? Or Harold the chimp, John. Harold the chimp. <laughs> Harold the chimp. <laughs> getting beat, getting beat up at the press conference by the uh, trainer. Uh, I well, my well, let me let me tell you my journey to the team. I was uh, uh, I graduated college and wanted to be in the National Hockey League, so. I started with a team called the Long Island Ducks out in Comac, Long Island. Yeah. And at the time it was the lowest form of hockey on the planet earth, but it was a start. <laughs> uh, and I was paid a fortune, $150 cash. So I was living pretty large. Uh, I had gotten engaged. And after a season there, I knew it was time to move on because there was no growth at that level, Eastern Hockey League. At the time, there was a new franchise in the National Hockey League, which is perfect for me, the New York Islanders. And uh, long story short, they offered me a job and a much bigger payroll. So I accepted it and uh, all ready to um, start. And they called me to renege on the job because they had moved into the New York Rangers territory. And because of politics, they had to give the job to someone from Rangers management's friend, whatever. So I lost the job. Uh, just as my wedding was coming up and uh, they said, someone's going to call you from the cosmos. I thought cosmos, I had no idea what the hell it was. I thought it began with a K. And uh, <laughs> I got back to the uh, Ducks office, Long Island Ducks office. And some lady said, you, you got a call from a guy named somebody from soccer. So I said, okay, leave the message. I'll pick it up on Monday. So I got in Monday and I said, where's the message? So I ripped it up, threw it in the garbage. So I, I just, I said, I'll take a look. I found a little piece of paper like that. It just said toy and a phone. <laughs> I called it up and then we, we met. So I went from the Islanders to the Cosmos, not even knowing what I was getting into other than I was getting married, needed a job. Um, and then Clyde, of course, was negotiating with me a salary and turned out to be $200 a, a week. I said, that's pretty large. I said, I need a little more. He goes, there's a lot of competition for this job. I said, I'll take it later on. He told me there's no one he had for the job. I said. 
So the, the 1972 season was, you know, jumped in it, uh, not knowing much about the game. Uh, saw it as an opportunity. We interestingly shared office space with, with Phil Woosnam, who was the commissioner of the NASL. So we were, you know, Clyde was basically in there a lot, helping him figure out how to run the league and do many other things. Um, one of the startling things in my early uh, days in the office, uh, Gordon Bradley and I shared a little office because um, uh, I, I realized I moved from the big time where, where the Ducks players were making, you know, $500, $400 a week. I said, geez, no, they're not making much money to survive here. So I was in with Gordon and I realized he was a part-time coach. He was, he was a soccer coach or a, co a, a teacher at a private school. And uh, one day he had some books open. I'm walking by, we're reading in Clive's office. And I look on, down on the book and he's got salaries. He's got this guy at a thousand, that guy at 1500. I said, it's not bad for a week. Uh, then later, uh, Gordon advised me that was for a season. <laughs> and many of the fellows on the phone worked at KLM Airlines uh, and other jobs to survive working and being pioneers in the North American Soccer League. And I thought that was uh, beyond belief that, that people would do that to start a, start a sport. Um, and Clive, uh, you know, but by the way, I got to show this picture. I have uh, the two men who were most influential in my life. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but it's uh, Clive Toy. I'm the guy in the middle of the hair. Yeah. Uh, that's Clive lighting his famous cigars and Gordon. Um, and they were, they were two great guys in my life. And the interesting uh, anecdote about the, the Cosmos and the Islanders is later on uh, when we, got to the point of signing Pele, the owner of the Islanders contacted me for um, a chance if I could get him into the locker room to meet Pele and the other players. And then about a month later, they offered me a job to work for the Islanders and the Nets. And they had offered me a job in 72 that got you know terminated. So now they offered me a job for both teams. And um, I turned it down because there was no sports marketing in college. And what I learned from Clive and Gordon over those years was too valuable to go to an unknown entity. So I stayed with the Cosmos, um, not knowing that we were gonna uh, tie up my time off a little bit. We hadn't signed Paley yet. So, you know, it was just better to stay with those two individuals because they were so great to me. And again, I was not a player. So it's just kind of a different side of, um, of life. Um, I will say the interesting thing I learned about the media coverage of the Cosmos games leading up to the championship, especially in New York, we had Alex Yanis, Dave Hershey, the New York Daily News, Ike Coons from the Star Ledger, Joe Marcus from the New York Post, and a guy named Hank Gola, uh, who was a senior at Montclair State and got the a beat to, to follow the Cosmos when he was a senior in college. He and I stayed in touch. We saw each other last year and he didn't know what to do because he was in college. And he said, I, I can't do this full time. The, the paper told him to figure it out. So he did. Hank just retired from the business. He's, he's now in New Jersey and in North Carolina. But uh, the media coverage, uh, those people in particular, Dave Hirsch, we'd be at a game and I had to be in the press box and they'd say, what's the attendance tonight? I looked out and there was oh, five, 600 people. And they would, and I'd go, uh, the attendance tonight. And Hershey would always speak up first. He goes, looks to me about 3,000 or 3,200. <laughs> That's the turnstile, 3,200. So that went on for the whole season because they had, to, they had to get a number at the end of the day that their editors would would let them put any sort of article in the newspaper. If there's no attendance, there'd be no media. And the articles were a couple inches big or a four by four, nothing much in the early days because it was viewed as Werner said, a bunch of foreigners, no Americans. So who would ever watch this game? And of course, over time that all changed. But the early days of the media guys who followed us and not one, unless we paid for it. I don't think that uh, maybe the post, but. None of, none of the newspapers would send them on the road and we couldn't get we couldn't get uh, TV coverage or anything. Matter of fact, what I did was I took subscriptions to, I think, Soccer America and sent it to every sports editor and everybody on TV like Marv Albert and Dick Schaap and the different people. So they knew something existed about the game of soccer. And eventually we were able to um, expand the coverage. The, um, 
the other interesting aspect of the game was we had a, a big game. We did all these promotions and it was, it was called uh, Burger King night or Burger King day at, at Hofstra. And we're giving out all sorts of coupons and different things to bring the crowd in. And my wife was um, expecting the baby, first baby. So any had timing wise, I signed enough beforehand. So I was within the law of how long she was pregnant when I'm telling the story. So um, I had to leave the press box and um, Charlie Catone will have to correct me. I don't know if Charlie was working for us at the time, but I had to leave the press box. That's when we had our first daughter who um, just turned 50. Um, so a lot happened to me in the early days. I, I, I uh, was going to be a star at the Islanders, ended up at the Cosmos and I got the correct spelling. Uh, we went on to have a great championship season and got these rings, which championship ring, if I'm not mistaken, it costs about $150 each. Um, was Willie Umfum on the team then, Warner? Um, I think that was before Willie. I, I really no. can't, can't tell. No, Willie, Willie was I on. Remember. I have a, I have, yes. He, Willie was on this team because I also have the other championship ring. The reason I say this, I hope you all appreciate it, is Willie called up one day and he and, and I knew what the cost of the ring was. So Willie um, says to me, John, um, you tell me how much gold is in that ring. I said, it's all gold. I don't want to tell him the price. I said, why? He goes, I want to have it melted down and put a cap in my tooth. <laughs> <laughs> I went, holy shit, I want to be there to watch this. Yeah, Willie <laughs> played with you on the Ukrainians that year too, didn't he, Randy? Weren't what, you that? I think uh, Willie was on the on the team that year, and he was with Randy on the Ukrainians that year, right? Again, a lot of people don't realize, you know, that why didn't the Cosmos, why didn't the NASL teams play in the Open Cups? Well, you had your player coach Gordon Bradley playing for Hota, which right, went on right. to win the Open Cup, right? So you were playing with the Ukrainians, and William Fum was was on the Ukrainians with yeah. you that. Yeah, yeah. with me. it was me. I'm not sure when he was there. I was I was with the Ukrainians in '71, and then I moved. Uh, to uh, the Delmatinek. Delmatinek, yeah. Yeah. You know, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of people never, people are never going to, I mean, there's not enough people to understand the history of, of the league and what went on in 72, but having been there, when you think of the uh, the pioneers and the dedication of the players who are on the, on the call today, and then people like Barry Mayhe and uh, Siega and... Um, I can't remember all the other fellows. Uh, Dieter Zadel. Dieter, Dieter, yeah. And Dieter, wasn't Dieter uh, selling uh, candied nuts or something on the weekends at fairs? Yeah, that was Ziggy Stritzel. Oh, they, they oh, Ziggy Stritzel, not to be yeah. confused. So we Keep had, and everybody is working a second job. Yeah. A second job. And I thought it was really, I, at the time, I would have to check the, the year, but in the, well, I was a hockey fan and a hockey player. And so in the early days of the NHL, top line players would be paid for the season. And in the off season, many or a good number had other jobs, including driving beer for the, the various beer sponsors in the, in the National Hockey League. So I figured, well, this is a natural growth. Now that I realize you guys were making a thousand a week or two thousand a week was a, for a season. Um, but uh, I got to tell you one last story. I'll, I'll move out. But uh, I remember when we went to, when Gordon Bradley passed away with a memorial at, at um, I think it was George Mason. We go down and a few yeah. of us spoke and uh, Shep Messing was uh, the goalkeeper and Shep was talking about uh, negotiating with, with Gordon mm. for a new season contract. And they're going back and forth and Gordon was uh, straight faced. And, and offered an amount of money. I can't tell you what the number was. And Shep says, well, at that amount of money, I'm not gonna sign. And he goes, you know, Gordon's response. I said, no, what, what Gordon say? He goes, I don't care. And he left the room, just moved on. And he's gonna win with whatever he had. Anyhow, that's a few of my recollections, but it was a great time in my life and started, it started my career. And along with the players, the uh, most impactful two people probably in my business I'm now retired five years. We're Gordon and Clive Toy. Yes. And then you, if, if you don't mind elaborating just a little bit on, on that kind of day to day life, uh, you were commuting all the way from Jersey, working on a graduate degree. Um, 
as many of you know, uh, Randy went on to have a most distinguished career in politics, becoming Speaker of the House in his, in his native Bermuda. So um, I, I should use the proper uh, nomenclature there, Randy. I apologize for the, the right honorable Randy Horton, I think is still the appropriate way to refer to you. Yeah, in terms of that amazing career that you had, that you were working on while you were with the Cosmos, but you also had a number of jobs connected to the Warner Empire, which right. even had studio with Led Zeppelin, right? Could you talk just a little bit about your day to day? But no, that was um, actually, that was fun as well. You know, um, and the first year I was, uh, <clears throat> I worked at Atlantic, Atlantic Recording, worked in the business at Atlantic Recording. And of course I had a great opportunity uh, to be able to go into recording sessions with Led Zeppelin and Roberta Flack. Uh, it was, <clears throat> it was big fun uh, going in and seeing these guys. And then of course, getting all of the, uh, the albums, all the jazz, I love jazz. Uh, so I got just about every jazz album uh, that Atlantic put out uh, without having to pay for it. Uh, so that was, that was big fun. Uh, and um, of course, working there, I used to run into Nassiri Erdogan, who was uh, uh, at the company. So I had opportunity to, uh, you know, connect with him. Uh, and then the next year, uh, I was working at the Warner Brothers Jungle Habitat. Uh, <laughs> yes. yeah. Could you tell for everybody that, that doesn't remember, you know, that um, this was even pre-Action Park era, right? So um, could you tell us where the habitat was and just how you would have commuted to training and, and how you would fit that all together? Yeah, that's right. It was, it was uh, way out in West Milford, New Jersey, which was a... Goodness, it was almost an hour drive from uh, from New York, and, and you know the thing about it was that you know I was doing that in days before I had my car, uh, and I didn't get a car. The Cosmos bought me a car. I think it was in '72. Uh, they bought me a car, uh, but before then I used to uh, I used to bus to New Jersey. I'll never get the first year in '71. I used to bus from my home in New Jersey uh, to um, uh, downtown and then take. Uh, take the subway uh, up to Yankee Stadium and walk to the game with the spectators, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and then on my way back, of course, I always had a ride with one of the uh, one of the other players. Uh, but um, that was an interesting aspect. And then, of course, in '72, uh, the Cosmos bought me a car. So then I, man, I was living luxury. I was I was able to I was able to drive from New Jersey. Uh, I was Strength. Um, you know, so it's it's it, it's all been great fun, you know, and I enjoyed uh, the experience of addition to the great experience of of, of playing, uh, but also at those companies at um, uh, first Atlantic Recording, uh, and then uh, at the Warner Brothers uh, Jungle Habitat. But to go back to what Werner was talking about, you know, the impact that that we had on young people, and and I remember two big going into speaking um, students and once I remember going to a high school uh, where I was there with Phil Rizzuto from the Yankees and Mike Ciani. Mike Ciani had just been uh, I think drafted by the uh, a team in Los Angeles, I think it was San Francisco uh, 49ers. He was a wide receiver and uh, we went to talk to uh, young people uh, and then we were you know we were I was given the same attention uh, as Phil Rizzuto and uh, Mike Ciani out there. So it was, you know, it was a big time, but more importantly, uh, we were impacting on, uh, on the young people. We've got a lot of really great questions that have popped in in the chat, and I'm sure there's a lot more uh, people would like to ask. Um, before we do that, though, I um, wanted to share with you some, some images. Uh, a couple of years ago, we, we lost um, the captain, the great captain of the 1972 uh, championship team, uh, Barry Mayhe, who, along with Gordon Bradley, was on the New York Generals. Um, and uh, I, I got to know uh, Barry um, thanks to the, the kind of reboot uh, in 2013. Uh, he and I share the same favorite beverage. I can't look at a can of Heineken now without thinking of him. Um, <laughs> I, I should uh, should avoid the product placement, but I, I, I think of uh, Barry every time I take a sip of Heineken now. Um, but his daughters, Stephanie and Kelly, uh, are with us right now. I'd want to say hello to them. A special shout out to the 
the wonderful Mayhe family. Um, mm -hmm. They've always made me feel so very welcome. Um, and I wanted to thank them for sharing so many great photos uh, with me. And what I wanted to do is uh, play a little bit of show and tell um, some images uh, and just to see if, if any of you who uh, were involved that, uh, that season uh, have any uh, thoughts to share on uh, what you may see here. So, um, beginning. Well, the first with... thing is a brochure that I put together with our ad agency with Gordon Bradley on the front cover. Yeah. Yeah. There's our player coach, Gordon Bradley. Yeah, uh, true. Really cool graphic. Yeah. Here's the uh, profiles of the team. You can see uh, Joseph didn't even get to have his photo in there, uh, a late edition, signing with the Cosmos on the 14th of March. Go ahead. Right, just as. The season was about to start. Same with Roby, uh, a late addition. Um, he, he, George Siega, all, you know, the first ever Cosmos uh, played out on the, the left wing. Uh, when he was injured, Roby um, took over in that spot. Um, but, uh, you know, photos for Roby uh, and Joseph and uh, goalkeeper uh, Dick Blackmore, um, not, even, not even pictured yet in those profiles. Uh, Bobby Neubauer passed away a few years ago. He got to go to a game um, before he passed away. And, and his son is a really important, valued member of the um, thriving uh, Cosmos uh, fan uh, groups. Um, so here's an image of the captain that I think in many ways uh, encapsulates uh, how tough he was, hard as nails. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on the captain, Barry Mayhew? Yeah, but Barry was like, you know, like you say, Barry was hard as nails. Uh, he was a tough, tough, tough uh, right back and a really tough class uh, defender. He, he he took no prison. I mean, he was he was serious, uh, serious about uh, about defending for sure. Yeah, he had no he had no thought in mind about uh, losing Barry. I remember that. Could you say that again, John? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, Barry, you know, I get to speak to all the players because in those days is what we all did. And Barry would never take any game approach other than winning. He never thought about losing. He would go, that picture says it all. He was tough as nails and, and just, would, you know, didn't give up. And, and vocal, and vocal. He was, he was the voice on the team. I think that yeah. uh, whatever strategies we had or developed, uh, you know, he would, he would, be there he'd you know encourage you but in most cases he'd uh you know he'd really establish at least from a defensive posture you know what we we're all about so yeah barry great player i know he did have to pick up a uh, a shoulder injury at one point where gordon came into the game to as a substitute for him but i do believe the next game barry was right back there no matter whether he was hurting or not i think he played through a lot of injuries in his career um Randy, there's a, a picture of you getting stuck in, and uh, I believe in the championship. <laughs> that's yeah. a game. That's a Sioux. St. Louis. Louis, yeah, I think that's in the championship. Yeah, um, in St. Louis, St. Louis. Yes. Yeah, you can't really yeah. see the rain there. Maybe you can pick out that it's raining in that image, but that's 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 the match 50 years ago today. Uh, I, I also remember, back to Randy a second, I remember... Um, this is me getting to know some of the other players so early in the game as I as I learned much about the sport Randy um, had a good tan um, and he had a big ass afro <laughs> a lot of smaller players just were scared to death of him and the question was is he as mean as he looks <laughs> I said yes <laughs> he's still just as mean yes <laughs> Joseph, there you are with Randy. Yeah. Classy, classy. There you are, Werner. Yes. Good shots. Good yeah. shots. Flying raw. Flying raw. Yeah. Yes, sir. Joseph, there you are again. Lovely shot. Wow. Some action in front of the goal. That's Barry John, Barry, John Barry and Barry May. Yeah. Yeah. Barry. There's uh, Werner over there uh, in line with the goalpost. What can you tell us about Richie Blackmore as a goalkeeper? Came from Birmingham City. Yes. 
Richie was Richie was one of the first. Um, I mean, along with Joseph, but one of the one of the first um, players that was re really just imported for the season, I think, at that time. Um, but it was the beginning of you know Clive's formula for getting the best international players you can afford and putting them together with the best local players um, uh, you could afford. But I think he was instrumental, certainly from a defensive posture in uh, that season, in us winning the championship that season. Uh, and then he was gone. Then I don't think he was there for the 73 season at all. There's Roby Young, who I, I was hoping would join us, but hasn't been able to. Filled in for George Siega on the left wing and uh, took the corner kick that uh, landed on Randy's head for the first goal in the championship match. Yeah. Randall Zyber. Experienced veteran, having been the captain of the Israeli World Cup and National and uh, Olympic teams. And Roby, too, was a very good, very good winger and, and great passer of the ball. Um, crosses were, you know, and playing. Uh, striker like I was, I, I love to play with players uh, who cross the ball well, and of course, Roby, and then of course, before him, of course, uh, there was George Siega, and I could judge George, so many, many uh, of my headers in particular came from, uh, by George Siega, and then also from Roby. Well, George had that great move, Randy, you remember, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fake right, go left, quick, uh, quick, beat quick. every defender, go to the touchline, and look for Randy in the middle. Right. And I would be there for him. Now, the, the, the NASL trophy wasn't the first one won by the club, technically. Here we see Barry Mayhew being given the Governor's Cup. Right? Um, again, oh. thanks to, to the Mayhew family for this photo. Um, if you... If you Focus in real close, you can actually see that the Governor's Cup is printed there. I think in some books they mistakenly uh, call that the NASL trophy. Um, the Governor's Cup, of course, was a competition uh, that uh, Governor Rockefeller had started, right? Um, which was essentially a two-team competition between the Cosmos and the Lancers. Do any of you remember anything about the Governor's Cup that year? Not so much, except that we won it. <laughs> Yeah, and it was just, just the games against the Rochester Lancers, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's, oh. a, There's a team photo that we all remember. Yeah. Oh. yeah. There's Willie Mumfum. Steve Ross. Tony Kerr with the champagne. Yeah. Everett Cummings. Gordon with uh, that winning laughter of his. Clive, Steve, Jay. Yeah, those were the days. Ziggy down in the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another image with that trophy. Here's the team with, with the full uh, allotment of trophies. And here's a more formal uh, team photo. John? Have a John. little bubble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's always helping with the uh, booze. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> John, what are you? Good stuff from Warner Communications. Wow. Right? More, more uh, anti. Uh, you see George Siega uh, with the crutches, right? right. And he's still yeah. injured there, uh, but he's in the locker room with crutches on behind there. Look at the shape of that locker room we have. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> Werner, a little different than what you had at Giant Stadium a few years later, right? Yeah, just a tad, but, you know, still a big step above what we had at the German American League and, you know, at the ethnic level. So, you know, this was all a step up, certainly for me, and I think a lot of the players that, uh, you know, were playing semi-pro and really didn't have that uh, breadth of experience in the pros. Yeah, this was the beginning. And Yankee Stadium in 1971, as it was about to be refurbished, probably wasn't palatial in your opening year either, right? Um, Randy, no, I don't know. No, no. And the, the, the thing about Yankee Stadium, too, uh, was the fact that because it was such a huge uh, stadium and then when we were playing in front of, uh, you know, a couple of thousand uh, fans, uh, it just the, the, the atmosphere was not um, uh, not very good at all uh, uh, in uh, in Yankee Stadium. I didn't enjoy, uh, even though that year I, 
I still I came out as the second leading scorer, leading scorer on the Cosmos, uh, but I enjoyed anywhere near uh, like I did once we went over to Hofstra. There's some more in the locker room. There's Roby Young, and there's the NASL trophy. Yes. You see the difference between the trophy. There's Barry Mayhe, uh, our, the the team captain, holding the league trophy there. Uh, and of course, a few days later, um, John, you may want to talk about this or everybody, right? Um, Joseph alluded to uh, his journey to New York and the, the Cold War that was going on, right? The Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. Right. Well, the Russians came. They almost didn't, though, because uh, they had a protest through UEFA. Uh, Rangers fans had swamped the field in the uh, UEFA Cup final. Uh, winning 3-2 and ending the game a little early. So Dynamo Moscow had wanted the final replayed um, and lost that petition and had to keep their... Uh, so this is a game that almost didn't happen. Uh, a much larger crowd a week later, right? Any any memories of that game with Dynamo Moscow? I know the State Department had to really intervene on behalf of the club. Uh, any of you, any thoughts on that? Or John, do you remember anything about the State Department having to help out getting Dynamo Moscow to Hofstra? Yeah, I... Oh, I I do remember the high quality of the game. I mean, it was it was great playing in that game, and I thought that even though we lost the game uh, two one, uh, but um, you know we played a, a a very good game of football uh, uh, in that match, and um, you know we're uh, we were unlucky in a way that we uh, weren't able to at least get a draw, but a, a good performance by our team, you know, against a a highly skilled Moscow Dynamo team. Which was coached actually by uh, by Yashin, uh, the yeah, world's best goal. No, the the Yashin was in a year after with Lokomotiva Moscow. You remember in yeah. Hofstra, nineteen seventy three, it was a Lokomotiv Moscow coaching by Werlef Yashin. Yes, yes, I remember. Yeah. I talked to him after the game because I speak a little bit Russian because I come in from Czech, Czechoslovakia. And uh, uh, he was very, very impressed with uh, uh, United States soccer. Yeah. Because I think so, we tied 2-2, two -two, I believe, something like that. But that was 1973 with Lokomotiva Moscow. Uh, the, the, the idea, as I recall, the idea of getting the Russian team to the United States um, was following up on the success the National Hockey League had done by playing uh, the Russian teams right. and increasing attendance. So Clive worked with a gentleman named Borja Lance, who I believe was in Switzerland. And Borja helped orchestrate uh, with Clive getting uh, Moscow Dynamo over and uh, other teams after that. But uh, that was the intent. And, and so there was a, a tour with Moscow Dynamo. Dynamo. And uh, I was you know, just a kid. Uh, and Clive said, I need you to go out with the Russian team to a, a number of cities as kind of spokesperson, representative, so to lead this Russian squad around. And I did. It was a great experience. Um, I learned a lot and I learned um, of, uh, that at the time, the Russian players were telling me there was Secret Service um, traveling with them, so they had to be careful what they did. Uh, I do know they travel with a lot of vodka because after that tour with them, I didn't drink vodka for about 10 years. <laughs> uh, they were wonderful guys, but um, it was it was a great experience for them and, and for me. And, and, I, and I think it helped the game. And Lamar Hunt, who was owner of the Dallas Tornado, and uh, if you recall, the the founder of the um, the um, AFL and, and National Football League and owned the Kansas City Chiefs. He was instrumental in getting some exhibition games put on as well because of his belief in, in building the sport. So Lamar was, you know, for those who know or don't know, he was a big um, fan and a booster of the game. So given the bad weather in the, the final 50 years ago today, this seems to me like it was a great occasion to just celebrate being champions, right? Uh, where the result maybe was uh, beside the point. Um, where Was the the party atmosphere on all week or was it a get back to business type of attitude in, in anticipation of this game? Any, uh, 
Any remembrances from those of you? Yeah, that I remember a big party at Bill's Meadowbrook. Our Bill's usual, Meadowbrook. <laughs> yeah, Bill's Meadowbrook in Hempstead, our usual uh, hangout. Yeah. And uh, Steve Ross and Jay Emmett, uh, you know, picking up all the tabs. So we drank and ate to our heart's content. Uh, probably closed the place down as usual. And, um, you know, the next day we moved on. <clears throat> Yep, that's it. Uh, here's the trophy hall from the uh, original NASL. And you can see on the left, the 1972 trophy that the club kept, right? The, the trophy that you saw Barry lifting there um, when Barry's wearing the yellow shirt, not the governor's cup, but the, the league trophy. I'm not entirely sure where that is right now. I, I've heard a few different rumors where it is. But uh, again, when we talk about hidden history or lost. Check uh, Pinton. Yeah. I don't know. Check Pinton's basement. Yeah, this was the this was our office we had in, in Soho on uh, Green Street. Is that when is that when the NASL trophy was uh, stolen and mysteriously disappeared after the '77 championship? Yeah, that you know with the then there was the, the soccer ball trophy, but then um, that original NASL trophy that like so it the trophy on the left there, the smallest of them, right? That's the trophy that the club got to keep in '72. Right. The league trophy went on, but yeah, John, I I don't know, I don't know what happened to that uh, league trophy. Um, so um, lots of great questions in the uh, chat room. Um, I want to take a look here. Um, William Goff has a question about the economics. John, you already talked about what you were paid. And you kind of alluded to uh, player wages there, um, and you showed the ring a little bit, right? Um, uh, so um, I think that was answered. Do any of you remember or care to share what what you were paid that year, or uh, how tough it might have been? Joseph, did were you set up with another job here? No, no, no. no. I I got a contract with uh, Cosmos for four months for eight thousand dollars. What? <laughs> uh, because I come in, I come in with uh, two other players. I come in with Chinezinho, who played for Juventus Italy, and I come in con con son of Helenio Herrera, yeah. which was the ma mago of the uh, European soccer, Spanish soccer. He was coached the time with Inter Milan. They call him Mago because well, they could form in the Catenacho, which means the defense, uh, the best defense in the world. And uh, I come in with his son, which has same contract like me. And uh, Chinesino, I don't know. My Chinesino play only one thing, one game, two games, and after disappear. I, um, John, excuse me one second. I've got somebody at my door in my house. And I need to go to my door. <laughs> uh, right. No, no worries. Go ahead, Randy. We'll 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 be here when you get back. Uh, Devender Sangha uh, asked a question about uh, um, status of North American soccer. Um, does it offend you when Europeans dismiss North American soccer? I always see you as pioneers. Over here, we are blessed that soccer has no competition in huge history, whereas in the states, you have to compete against all the other sports there. Um, the marketing and promotion was ahead of its time. Uh, indeed, a, a credit to John. Any, any thoughts on, on uh, do you ever get defensive about uh, American soccer history the way uh, some of us soccer historians do? I don't. Uh, I think I understand the temperament and uh, certainly in some cases share it. Uh, but America is a different animal from um, the international a game. It makes its own rules. You know, it it uh, has to compete against all these other games. It it's not the historical uh, centerpiece of everybody's life that it is in the rest of the world. So I certainly understand from a enthusiasm standpoint, from a recognition of you know the quality, from uh, the competitive standpoint, and even to this day. You know, the fact that uh, U.S. pro soccer doesn't have promotion and relegation, uh, you know, it's a black eye on our game, on our American pro game, 
um, I think unnecessarily um, um, uh, gotten, but um, I think I understand and, and appreciate uh, the, the negative attitudes as well as in some cases, the positive attitudes um, you know, that, that uh, international fans have about the American game. But you know, in retrospect, we were, as a, as a sport, we were uh, you know, kind of pissing into the wind in the early days. You know? uh, there was so much competition for fans. There was so little resources to market and promote. Uh, you know, we were kind of behind the financial ball. Uh, the idea that Randy had a car and Joseph was paid $8,000 just blows my mind. I was, get, I, was getting, I was getting $69 after taxes a week. Uh, you got that? Almost, almost as much as I was getting paid under the table by uh, the German Hungarians. But, um, you know, back to the original point, um, I think uh, American soccer has made tremendous strides, in particular on the player development front. And against, you know, without a lot of help from the MLS and the, the national programs and, you know, uh, all of those folks up on high, uh, this was done through players, coaches that are out there beating the bushes, that love the game, kids that started playing when they were six, seven years old. We still don't have the early childhood uh, development that the rest of the world has, which puts us uh, steps behind, I mean, leaps and bounds behind the developmental uh, aspect of the international game. So I understand that, uh, that, that um, you know, thought about uh, American soccer, but I think we, you know, on the other side of the coin, we have a long way to go and I think we're gonna get there. I think at some point, somebody's gonna figure out the promotion relegation piece, and that's gonna jettison us you know, uh, through that ceiling. And I think our, our leadership in the women's game, I think is appreciated and respected internationally much more than, so than the, Ameri than the men's game. I, I also wanna comment on Werner mentioning the competition of other sports team, teams in the New York market. So in my first year in 1972, as I recall, there was 11 professional sports teams in every category. And so when we had to put together a press conference and get media coverage, we had to find a day when no one else was holding a press conference related to basketball, football, tennis, you name it. That was a huge challenge. And, and uh, one antidote was we, we couldn't get arrested with media coverage. So Clive came up with an idea and probably in cahoots with Randy Horton to uh, a <laughs> press conference for the signing of a new player. So we got media coverage, it was a big to-do, and we come out with Harold the Chimpanzee. <laughs> a chimpanzee wearing a Cosmos shirt and shorts. And the place went hysterically funny, and we, we got a lot of, I can't remember who else was there from the player side. I just remember Harold with a trainer from Jungle Habitat. It was all going great until Harold went wild and jumped <laughs> off the table, and you saw systematically, the trainer dive over the table and jump on this monkey and Alex Yanis and Dave Hershey, oh my God, he's gonna beat the crap out of this poor monkey. It's gonna be all over the media coverage. That was one of our biggest press conferences in 1972. Yeah, I was there. I attended that press conference, John. And uh, um, I remember Harold, upon his introduction, started pissing all over the table. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> as his opinion of what this was all about, he was pissing everywhere. And the trainer uh, retaliated, you know, really harsh, but it was because Harold was pissing all over the place. Yeah. And that's what got more press than, uh, you know, than our game. And we did it at the upscale Warwick Hotel, which was out of our budget, but we did it there nonetheless. Uh, the place went bananas, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't help myself with that. Uh, Joseph, just a follow-up question uh, from Kuichi Shirayan. Um, how did the, you, you said you had the, the lavish salary of 8,000 for the season. How did that compare to what you were paid in Czechoslovakia? Um, oh, no, no in comparison. Uh, Czechoslovakia, you was, uh, you was uh, an amateur, practically was. 
and of us uh, like pay they they you have a uh, uh, bonuses by the game ma no salary where like you have job ma you never to go to work you have job the company pay you you play soccer and they give you bonuses you win you have 300 coronas you lose you don't have nothing well, I think that's another thing with American soccer history. A lot of people forget, and uh, you know, even you know, Walter Barr told me that the Busby offered him a spot on Manchester United, but he couldn't go over there and play for Manchester United because he was making more money living here in the states. Uh, Absolutely. Together, living Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and teaching his ed. So, um, so even in Europe in those times, right? Uh, it's not like. Uh, American soccer was a, a step down in terms of salary for a lot of people. Um, Marcus Cranston has a question. Um, uh, started following the NASL in the late 70s as a kid in a small farm town, uh, but he got to meet Siggy Stritzel and Henry McCulley. Um, he asked, were you all on single season contracts? And um, after winning the championship, how did negotiations go? And were other teams contacting you to try to steal you away? I had, I had after, um, uh, after we won the championship in uh, uh, 72, I was offered, offered a contract with uh, the um, uh, Queens Park Ranger in the uh, second division. They were in the second division in uh, the United Kingdom, and they were. Um, uh, getting ready. In fact, they came up the next season. They came up to the first division. Rodney Marsh, in fact, was uh, mm. uh, at the time, uh, but I I turned it down because I wanted to, um, you know, complete my my studies. Uh, uh, plus, uh, the thing is, the money was great, so I thought staying in New York. That's what were you a Tottenham fan yet then, Randy? Was that a factor or did that come later? Uh, no, no. I, <laughs> no, I was, I was already a Tottenham fan. <laughs> I've been a Tottenham fan since 1963. <laughs> yeah. So it was North London maybe, but West London, no thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, another question from Michael Lewis. Um, Michael, uh, if you're there, I'll let you go ahead and, and ask the question for Joseph in the chat. Mike, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, Joe, how you yeah. doing? Joe, how you doing? Um, yeah, I asked a very simple question uh, in the, writing it down, but you know, you played in the greatest tournament in the world in 1962, the World Cup. And I know the World Cup has changed dramatically since then. What was it like? Uh, this is a multi-layered question. What was it like playing in the World Cup at that time? How big a deal was it? Um, and the fact that Czechoslovakia reached the final, finished second, had to be a big deal back home. How were you and your teammates received? Well, um, and thanks for putting up with my question. Yeah, I listen, for, for me, I was 17 years old. And uh, for me, it was a big deal for everybody. We coming from a communist country. We got the, 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 the decent team. We got my Masopust, or we have Popluhar, or we have Shroif. And we come into the final, really, uh, because we're in a, in a, the, the, the uh, groups, we tie 0-0 zero, zero with Brazil. And after we, we come into the final, and we winning one nothing against where well, one of the best Brazilian team in ever with Jalma Santos, Nilton Santos, Zagalo, uh, uh, Vava, Pelé, Didi, unbelievable team. Uh, we lost 3-1 in the uh, second half, they scored by Zagalo and uh, Amarildo scored two goals, uh, we lost 3-1. And uh, when we come into the home, of course, we have a huge, huge, ma we don't have no big deal for the premium. We do it for country. We play for country. We don't play for money. We play for country. Like, like Russia, like uh, it's, it's no value of the 
what we did for A was we play for country. I have a quick follow-up question. Did you get any monetary compensation at all? It we, doesn't sound like you did, but. Yeah, we, we got uh, probably like 20,000 coronas that time. It's not as big as monetary day. It was like 20, 30,000 coronas that time. Probably one year salary of people who are working all year. We got year salary. Thank you. Devender, did you want to ask the, the question, the second question you put in chat? Are you available to speak or should I ask the question for you, Devender? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, hi guys. Um, it's fascinating listening to you all. I mean, you're all legends. I'm, it's it's sort of a, a real honour to be here. Um, but um, it's more about racism, really. Obviously, Britain um, in the 70s, um, football, there was horrendous racism and it's probably got better over time. I mean, it's far better now than it ever has been, possibly post-1990. Um, did anything like that occur in the NASL in the early 70s, especially the 72 season? I, as, a, as a player, uh, I, I didn't... Um, uh, any... This calls, I certainly didn't notice it uh, anyway. Um, uh, while I was uh, while I was playing, so that didn't uh, impact me uh, uh, at all during uh, during the time that I was um, was obviously there was the odd uh, there was the odd person uh, screaming out <clears throat> to me negatively, but it wasn't uh, necessarily racist. I recall. Yeah, I, I'd, hope, I'd hope Deverell Cummings was going to join us. You know, he he played for the Atlanta Chiefs. Um, right before before joining here and coming from trinidad he had a uh you know he, he got to know uh the reverend dr martin luther king jr as he was playing there in atlanta um and so i think a lot of that you know from the experiences of, of players all around the country it would it would depend upon what club you were with and where you were playing too right uh so he when he i know whenever he came to atlanta suddenly he was facing uh, a, a degree of segregation and racism that um, was unaccustomed to him. Uh, but it, it's, it's an oh. element of, of the sport at the time that we don't put enough attention to. Uh, anybody else wanted to say something about it? Yeah, I, yeah, I did want to say, say something. Go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. Okay, I, mine's simple. I, I be, Being the PR guy at the time and not a player and just trying to get my arms around the game, uh, I was fortunate enough to meet so many of the other players um, on, on various teams. And um, I'm sensitive to the question. Um, and I can say from my experience, there was nothing that was racist going on. The, uh, as I alluded to a little being funny about it, the only question about Randy was the, the, the people were scared because he's a tall guy and he had a big a Afro. And uh, you know that made him almost twice the size of some of the smaller guys. So he was the striker. Um, he was an imposing figure, but I can say without, without question, I never heard a racist comment about him or anybody. Yeah, I was going to make the point that, uh, you know, New York City in the 70s uh, was racist, sexist. You know, it was, it was all the negative things that you can imagine socially. But the great thing was when it came to the game of football, Within the game, there was little, if any, racism. I remember, uh, Randy, you came to my house in Ridgewood, Queens, for dinner one night. And uh, we, we parked uh, you know, a block away, and we walked to, uh, to my house, and we had a great dinner. Um, but the next day, my parents got questions about, you know, uh, Werner was you know, seen with a big black guy, and uh, what's going on? And, and, uh, you know, people, people expressing their racism. But for them, and what I found interesting, we were all ethnic. We were, we were all, uh, you know, being, being uh, you know, racist ag against, uh, you know, I was German post-war, you know, uh, po post-World War II. Certainly I heard the, the word Nazi and, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, all, the, all, all the criticisms and all the racism against Germans at that particular time. Um, we were, 
we were all part of ethnic groups who were inherently racist against other ethnic groups, literally. But when we came out onto the field, we were one. There was never, there was no tolerance for racism at that time, you know, in the locker rooms or, or, or the playing fields. Uh, but it was, it was night and day, uh, certainly between um, you know, the, the impact of racism on the game and the impact of racism in society. And uh, I can appreciate it as a lot of ethnics can. And I always wondered why one ethnicity can be racist against another when they're being, you know, racist against from other groups. So it was all, it was all a, a, an interesting dichotomy. Uh, that's a, that's a very interesting perspective. I think we're on a yes. And, and, I, and as, as you say, I myself. I don't know whether it was just because of me or who I am. Maybe I'm good, maybe I'm good looking, but uh, <laughs> you know, but but people always uh, gave me, always gave me the respect. And you, you talk about when I went uh, with you, Werner, and then of course, you know, playing when I played, playing in the German American League or with the Ukrainians, and then later with Del Medinac. And I can tell you that on the field, if any uh, said when I'm particularly when I was with Del Matinac, if <clears throat> anybody said anything negative about me on the field, those players would, uh, they, if anybody did anything negatively towards me, the rest of the players would be on that in a, you know, in a quick time. Uh, so I was, you know, I was incredibly well protected when I was, when I was playing uh, out on the field and in some tough situation because we're on a you know the German American League you know when uh, Del Martinek was playing Croatia or brutal oh, brutal it, it, it was brutal uh and uh but I never had to worry because those guys they took care of me all the way around <laughs> one uh one big issue that I, I, I always kind of fascinates me about the 1972 season uh, that a lot of people forget, and I think may have even been a little bit of a factor in that match 50 years ago today, um, was that the FIFA allowed the NASL to play with the rules or play with the laws of the game um, mid-season. As the season had started, FIFA granted uh, the NASL the opportunity to experiment with the offside line, right? And so um, rather than midfield, and again, a lot of us uh, may remember the 35-yard the line and the great shootouts that would happen from there. Um, but in, at the very beginning of the 1972 season, a few games in, uh, suddenly the offside law changed. Um, how difficult was that adjustment? What did players think of that innovation? And was that at, at all a factor in either of those uh, controversial plays for St. Louis in the final. Um, and again, to me, one of the, one of the great frustrations uh, is that we don't have the footage from this match, right? We can watch the 1977 championship match, uh, which I have countless times. <clears throat> um, I think I've watched Shep's miraculous save uh, to keep it all there a, a thousand and one times, right? Um, but uh, the 1972 championship final, we don't have the video of that. Um, but if that was played today, we might have had a little bit of VAR interference, right? The very first goal, the equalizer, right, on the, right at the beginning of the second half, if memory serves, St. Louis scored, the referee disallowed it, but then they appealed the assistant referee that it was a legitimate goal, and they let it stand. Um, and then red-carded Werner off the pitch, St. Louis thought they scored, but that was taken away. Um, any memories about either one of those controversial calls in the final or any memories of, about having to adapt to a new offside law, especially you, Werner, as a defender? I don't, I don't recall having any difficulty uh, adapting to any of the uh, um, changes of rules. I'm not so sure it was done with FIFA's uh, you know, overriding support. I think um, you know the NASL was was on a on a path of Americanizing the game, of making it more interesting and more entertaining. 
uh, you know, the laws of the game as originally constituted by FIFA were not etched in stone as far as uh, our league was concerned. I'm not even sure if at that time we were a legitimate member of FIFA. Uh, we probably were, but I don't think it mattered. I think we played by our rules. We played by, uh, you know, what we felt was, was uh, in the best interests of the game uh, in America. Uh, and certainly 35 yard line opened up the game uh, substantially for more passing, uh, for more attacking play. Defensively, it was a little more challenging because uh, uh, defensively you always use that halfway line as a, as a kind of a stop gap uh, for, for many attacks. And, you know, we used offside defensively constantly, um, you know, um, when we could. Uh, the 35 yard, like the shootout, as opposed to the penalty kick, everybody loved, including the players that took them. Um, so I, I think FIFA kind of came around and certainly, you know, history proves us to have been correct to some degree, although the halfway line is still etched in stone um, as, uh, as the offside line. But, you know, now we have uh, three uh, substitutes, which initially there were only two. Uh, you know, we have numbers for every player that originally were not, uh, you know, part of the, the FIFA laws of the game. There it was 1 to 11. And if you substituted a player, that player would have to take the number and the shirt, sweaty shirt of the player that they replaced. Uh, so I think, you know, we, we played with the rules. We initiated a lot of interesting developments in the game that ultimately proved to be correct. Yeah, me, you, you, as strikers, uh, uh, did, yeah. did, did the goal help you or did the, uh, did the change there, to the offside law come across oh, you, as an opportunity to you? I don't remember the 35 yard line uh, helping, uh, helping that much. And I don't- but in, in 72, sorry to interrupt, but in 72 it was at, to the 18 yard line equal with the penalty box at the 18 yard line not not all the way 30 yards uh, and so um but i don't remember it impacting on the way i played uh that much although of course obviously if, um offside line is up that high it means you play higher uh, higher up the pitch uh but um i don't uh, remember it uh, having effect on how well i played uh, in uh, in the games that I played, but but certainly, um, you know, I like the way I like the halfway line actually because it it makes uh, uh, it makes defenders work, uh, you know, also it makes defenders work harder. It also gives uh, I think it forwards a great opportunity, a great opportunity to be creative uh, against those uh, uh, against those defenders. So. I'm not against it uh, at the halfway line, even though uh, it was supposed the 18 yard line or 30 yard line was supposed to be beneficial to uh, attacking play. Joseph, do you do you remember that law change? And no, I listen. I come in in the field, and uh, I don't remember nothing of the. Uh, I remember when they changed uh, the penalty shots which I never liked that, uh, but, you know, I know I can, I can, uh, I can say nothing about it, the rules, but what they do, they do. A soccer player, a soccer player, they go play and they do the best can, they can. And do, do any of you remember that uh, final controversy when St. Louis thought they had equalized, but uh, the referees waved it off? Yeah. I Controversial calls in the game, right? Um, because I, I wouldn't have been um, been close to the situation. Maybe had been a corner corner kick. So I don't I don't I don't remember it. Uh, Me I don't, oh. no. Run, I don't even remember. Run and all that I'm talking about it. You know, as was said that you were sent off. I'm now thinking that gee, he was he was sent off. He played the last. The last few minutes of yeah, me too. <laughs> Billy, Billy Roy scored for them with thir 13, 18 seconds left, like the last minute. Uh, 
Willie Roy put the put the ball in the back of the net, but it was disallowed. I remember that. I think yeah. 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 Thank goodness. Well, we've we've reached ninety minutes, so uh, I think that game time full session. So I think uh, unless anybody has a, a pressing uh, question, um, now that we're into to added time. Uh, any final thoughts from our distinguished uh, alumni? I just want to say I just want to say that playing with these guys was uh, the pleasure of my lifetime, and uh, I think uh, you know it wouldn't have been the same without all of them. So thank you guys for making the game what it was. And, and I'd like to add what Bernie said to it. I tell you that. I really loved uh, playing uh, with the guys every year, four years uh, with the Cosmos. And I can certainly say uh, that I really, really enjoyed, made some great friendships. We stay in touch uh, over and over. Werner, for instance, I mean, I'm in contact with Werner uh, a lot. He's even been to my house, um, visited Bermuda uh, when I celebrated my 60th birthday. And I won't tell you who that was because I make myself too old. <laughs> but it's just been, it was, it was great fun um, um, with the guys. There was hey, no money in it, like, like you said, at the time, uh, little money in it, great enjoyment. And also the fact that we know that we had stuck, and now we see uh, has come to a fruition. Right. And thank all the guys, uh, Werner and um, Joseph who are here today, of course, John, who works in the office, uh, doing a great job. Uh, to, to everybody who's involved with the Cosmos, I'm thankful. Uh, because well, it's it, on it, my it, it, uh, From my perspective, it spilled over in the front office, me being a, a you know, young kid and seeing what the players did and how they unified on the field and the uh, desire to win and all that Gordon and Clive did. It was, for me, what I couldn't get in college for my goal was sports marketing and be in the National Hockey League. But after a season in the NASL in 1972, I knew my destiny was with the Cosmos and staying there, but it was a building block on my career uh, right to um, when I retired five years ago. So thank you all. And uh, me, what I want to say is uh, I like to uh, thanks to Clive Toy, uh, all the Cosmos orga organization because they built the foundation of American soccer. And uh, listen, uh, we everybody get involved. Yeah, Bernard, what do you want to say? Okay. Go ahead, Joseph, go ahead. Oh, and I, I like to wear uh, really. Uh, Clive Toys and Gordon Bradley and John were here. They put in hours and hours to the way, and they, they finally built something where it's today the best sport ever in the United States. Well, thank you all uh, for, for coming together today. Thank you for our distinguished alums. Uh, as someone said 45 years ago, Love, love, love. Uh, I love you guys. Uh, you were my heroes as a kid. Um, it's just the greatest honor my, uh, to, 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 to call you friends, to consider you uh, friends. Um, always so considerate, always so caring. Um, thank you to my colleagues in the Society for American Soccer History for uh, hosting this event today uh, to honor these great, great legends of the game. And I'm, so glad that uh, this event is being recorded so that future generations will be able to, to see this document as a, as a text that, that'll really be a, a great resource for those who wanna understand uh, the pioneers who, who transformed the, the American sporting landscape. So um, I have to say the first time I went to the Mayhee home, I thought I'd bonded with uh, Captain Barry uh, over my uh, favorite beverage. I didn't realize that he was getting it for free from KLM all those years. <laughs> but uh, certainly uh, in your honor, in his honor, and in honor of the whole team, I will uh, be hoisting one of Captain Barry Mayhew's 
uh, favorite beverages uh, as, as we uh, go off this uh, session. But thank you all. Um, 50 years, a half century. Um, it's, it's so great to be able to, to celebrate this on, on the very uh, anniversary day. So thank you champions for joining us and thank you everyone for, uh, for Enjoy. honoring this legacy. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you to you, John, for the effort you put into keeping the customers alive. Thank you. Thanks, David. David, thank you. Thank you, guys.